All right, let's get started. So, last time when we left off, we had moved the chapter and we're just trying to motivate that when we get to the point where we can build these stock and flow diagrams, we can come to get some better understanding of the systems that have small components that we might be able to understand in isolation, but when we put together, it's difficult to see how they'll interact with other components to give us kind of the full system behavior. So the basic components that will go into these models are these so-called stock and flow models where you've got these stocks that have inflows and outflows and our goal will be to come up with the right stocks for our models and then come up with basic expressions, so algebra, you know, like expressions for inflow and outflow which represent how the stocks relate to each other. And although it will be relatively easy to write these expressions, when we link all of these things together, it's not going to be clear what's going to happen. And so that's where the kind of the computational part comes into play. So the stocks here, this is just a review from last time, are the state of a system. They change over time. So when we think about these systems, we're thinking about systems that are dynamically changing over time and the things that we kind of keep track of that are changing from one instant to another we call these stock variables. And I might also refer to them as state variables. The rate of change of a stock is what we call its flow. And we might then uh, specialize that to say that if, it is, um, if it's an inflow, that means that we describe the rate of change in terms of how the stock is increasing versus an outflow, which means we describe the rate of change versus how the, the stock is shrinking. But they're both just flows. And the net flow into the stock is kind of what the, determines what level, like this is a water level, and how it changes over time. And how all this works is what we're going to get to. And so the frameworks that we introduced today are sort of how are stepping stones to this eventual picture. And the reason that we build this picture is that this is, I claim, a simpler way to do modeling that would otherwise look like this. This diagram up here is identical to this differential equation down here. So if you took SOS 211, um, you got sort of an appreciation of calculus, and so an appreciation that these models exist and are out there. And so with that appreciation, now we can, um, in, instead of using this uh, framework, we use this kind of more graphical framework that which again I'm claiming is identical, but because we instantiate it in a computer simulation model, the computer can do the hard work of you know, integrating this out and seeing what happens over time. We don't have to manually do that ourselves. That's kind of the goal of reorienting a computer simulation and not trying to do this all mathematically. So where this kind of idea came from was this uh, system dynamics modeling from Jay Forrester. I wrote a, um, uh, some, some influential literature back in, say, the, I think the 70s. Um, it had this one model of the world where he said that, well, we're going to pick these five stocks, and uh, they each have their flows going in and out of them, and they all link together in this web. And it's a complicated web. Uh, and so we can understand, like, if I were to zoom in on any one particular portion of, like, the pollution stock, I might be able to make an argument that I figured out all the things that contribute to pollution. But when I connect all the things together, I don't quite understand how pollution uh, plays a part in population and then how that population then plays a part in pollution. So that longer scale connection is not quite as obvious. But the short term stuff, that's the easy stuff to model. And then gradually as we model more and more of the short term stuff, the local stuff, we get this global picture. And it's this kind of messy web. And so with that web, um, you can say, well, I don't quite know what's going on here, so I'll use a computer simulation to generate trajectories of these state variables, how they behave over time. And under certain conditions, so certain parameter settings, I might get collapsing trajectories like this. And under others, I might get more sustainable looking ones like this. And so we can use this tool to try to understand what are the kind of ways in which we can configure our use of the Earth to put ourselves more likely in this picture than in this picture. So that's kind of the motivation behind why Forrester did this, is that this is really hard to reason about, so let's let a computer 
um, experiment with this model on a computer and find the sets of parameters that would put us in certain uh, modes versus others. And or even just ask ourselves, based on what we know about our current resource use, are we more likely in this uh, setting or in this setting? So it's kind of the background, the motivation behind all of that. And so a term that we use for this perspective is we call it the endogenous perspective. And so that means that the observable changes in the system are in large part essentially predictable consequences of what's going on inside. So you might, if I didn't show you this, if I just said, if I claimed that these were data taken from the actual Earth, uh, then these data right here, um, you might say, well, this collapse, that's due to an, uh, an external event. Maybe um, you know, a, a, a rock from space hit the Earth, and that's what caused this collapse. That would be a so-called exogenous perspective. And we're saying that these interesting things that happen only happen because something outside the system comes in and forces them to happen. This perspective is that Forrester was saying, no, actually, even without these external shocks, your internal system can still generate these trajectories. So even without, you, I mean, you can think that you're going along fine and think you're going to be growing forever, but there's that as you move through the system, you're sort of internally reconfiguring your system. And that internal reconfiguration from your own use of your natural resources can lead to an eventual shift in the behavior of the system without any external drivers. So that's what we mean by we take the endogenous perspective with this modeling framework. There are other modeling frameworks where you do the exogenous, where you ask, how robust would we be to um, an external uh, forcing event? So if we did get hit by that space rock, how likely is it that we'd survive? And so that, you know, we're actually sort of expanding the model to include these, these extra events. But here, we're saying, no, we're not worried about these weird things that are going to happen. This really is just a property of the internal system. Are there questions about what I mean then by endogenous versus exogenous? By things that are driven from the internal dynamics of the system and not from the external. This perspective that huge changes here can happen even without an external hand coming in and swapping the system. So with these stock and flow diagrams, they really only get interesting if you have feedbacks. So this is a very simple model of a fishery. You've got uh, you know, these, the fish, or the thing we're monitoring over time is the number of fish in the fishery. We know that those fishery have a regeneration rate. And so when you get more of those fish, the regeneration rate might go up, it might go down. But whatever it does, that will contribute to more fish later. Question. I had a question about what you were talking about just now. Yep. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't most of the systems be, um, wouldn't, wouldn't endogenous systems be very rare? Well, I guess, well, so that's a good question. So um, it's a system, I, this endogenous perspective is a modeling framework for building a model of a system. So all systems, I think what you're kind of saying is all systems are going to be driven by external parts and internal. And, and what we're saying here is that we're saying how far can we go in predicting the behavior of the system if we neglect the external part and just focus on the internal part. Does that make sense? That was a good question. So, um, so here you've got this, you know, we've drawn this diagram and how to draw this diagram, again, this is, this is what we're moving towards. And so we're gonna build tools today to get us closer to this. But this is just sort of a simple example of where we're going. And there's a feedback here. As you get more fish, it may change the regeneration rate, which will change the number of fish you have in the future. And so uh, if we draw this regeneration rate, then we see that as the fish density is low, then with more fish, you have more reproducers. And so with more reproducers, you have a greater reproduction rate. And so you get this, this uh, growth rate here. But then once your density gets high enough, then there are so little resources available that even though you get more fish, your offspring can't eat. And so those offspring don't survive to reproduction. So you end up getting a regeneration rate that actually declines as you increase. 
And so you have a growth process going on here that then eventually gets in check by a limitation process here. So it's a reinforcing loop followed by a balancing loop. And that, whenever that happens, you get these S-shaped curves where this S-shaped curve here is the number of fish in the fishery. It starts low, it rapidly rises, it hits some inflection point, and then it settles off. And this other curve is the regeneration rate. So that inflection point where it stops accelerating and starts decelerating happens to be the, the crit, at the critical density where the, the regeneration rate is maximized. And so we've drawn this static perspective of regeneration rate, and now we've simulated it over time, and we can see how that leads uh, to, a fish, uh, to a fish population reaching a carrying capacity and even see like roughly how long it takes for that to happen. So that's kind of what we've modeled here. And these S-shaped curves are going to be in common whenever you have uh, these reinforcing loops followed by these balancing loops. Because we kind of predict that they're going to happen if we see them in the diagrams. But the problem with the diagram that I showed you um, is that I actually don't obviously see two loops here. It's all hidden in this weird regeneration rate curve. So it's really hard for me to stare at that and make a guess at what's going to happen because I need to like plot this regeneration curve and then think it through. So a better way to draw these models is like this. And this is the equivalent model. So you can have multiple models. Uh, you, know, you can have multiple models with different assumptions all modeling the same system. But you can even have different ways to draw the exact same model. And so here, I've got my fish population in the middle here. And instead of bundling up birth rate and death rate all under one curve, I actually have a separate birth process and this has just got a nice exponential growth process in here where as I get more fish, I get more births, and I get more fish. So I get just one reinforcing loop here. And then I've split out that limitation process over here where now I'm saying as I get more fish, there are less resources available. So here, as I get more fish, I get more deaths effectively here. And as I get more deaths, then I end up getting less fish. And so this balancing loop here this outflow here is capturing the, 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 the idea that as I get more fish, I get closer to my maximum, or I get more and more limited, which means I just get more and more fish death. So initially more fish means a, a bigger inflow of fish birth and not that much of an outflow of fish death. But eventually once I get more and more fish, I end up getting a, a larger outflow of fish death than fish birth. And so by drawing these processes separate, instead of hiding them inside this, I actually start seeing loops that are in the stock and flow diagram right next to each other. And it starts looking like that dynamic theory I had where I have a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop leading to that S-shaped curve. And, and that, uh, there's an intermediate form of that that we talk about today, we're calling the causal loop diagram, where this is capturing, without worrying about the dynamics, without worrying about any of the calculus right now, we're just modeling the feedbacks. And so I'm saying here that there's a population that has uh, an effect on births, but it also has an effect on deaths. The birth loop uh, ends up being growth. The death loop ends up being uh, a reduction in the population, and those two are next to each other. And I can either think of this as a tool for translating from this very abstract view to the concrete view. So the causal loop diagram helps me figure out how to build my stock and flow diagram. Or if somebody hands me a complicated stock and flow diagram like Forrester's with that web, I can take that stock and flow diagram and simplify it by only drawing the loops I find. And then from those loops, I can then come up with th things that where I'm only looking at the loops and then I can make a guess of what might be going on in Forrester's diagram. So these causal loop diagrams either can be used in one direction or the other. And uh, we, in primarily in this class, are going to be focusing on the upward direction, where we're going to be building the causal loop diagrams first, and then using them to help us figure out how to build the stock and flow diagrams. But if you look at other textbooks, so we're taking the kind of approach that's come out of the Moorcroft textbook, other textbooks go the other way around. 
where they teach you how to do the stock and flow diagrams, kind of the calculus-based uh, version, and then add the causal loop diagrams on top of that. And it's my claim that these are apparently conflicting, but it's really just in the purpose of time, you have to choose one direction. But in practice, we constantly kind of go both ways. We sort of say, hmm, it seems to me like there's some limitation going on here, but there's amplification going on here. I might end up viewing a causal loop diagram in my head and then building a dynamical model. Or I could go the other way around where somebody writes a differential equation and I say, I don't really want to understand what's going on here. Let me write the feedbacks. Oh, now I see what's going on here. So we do both in practice, but in this class, we're going to focus on the causal loop diagrams first. So for the rest of this lecture, we're going to introduce all of the elements of the causal loop diagram. But that's kind of a roadmap for where we're going. So with that, are there any questions? This question slide um, provides me the 30 seconds of time that you normally need for the first question to come up. Because I get to look at it and explain that questions are like the fish population in that initially uh, it takes a long time to get that first question. But once somebody asks the first question, it ends up allowing other people to feel like they can ask questions. So you end up getting an amplification of questions, but eventually everybody's questions get answered. So that limits them. And then eventually you get no more new questions. So you have an S-shaped growth of questions. I thought we had three rotations. <laughs> yes. Why, do, why are we focusing on the upward? Um, on the CLDs first? CLDs first as opposed to the other way around? It's somewhat arbitrary. Um, in the social sciences, I don't come from a social sciences background. But in the social sciences, it's traditional to teach this material with CLDs and then dynamical models. In uh, the natural sciences, it's traditional to go the other way around. It's just a conventional thing. But in practice, once you get to using this, regardless of where you are, um, both, they're all equally valid tools, the CLDs and the stock and flow models. Sometimes you start with one, sometimes you start with the other. But we just have to choose one for the purposes of pedagogy. So we just go CLDs first. Other questions? All right, so uh, CLDs. Now first, some terminology. So I will use a lot of these terms interchangeably. So um, on this side, these are all the terms relate to what we're calling positive feedback. So if you've heard the term positive feedback, that's equivalent to the term reinforcing feedback. Sometimes people refer to a snowball effect. That is another way of saying positive feedback. Now here's a confusing one. People will often use the terms vicious cycle and virtuous cycle. And they sound like they're opposite. But both of those mean the same thing. So a vicious cycle is a positive feedback that is bad. And a virtuous cycle is a positive feedback that we, we uh, assign a quality to of good. So a vicious cycle might be that um, you know, every, time I, um, every time I get stressed out, I eat. But as I eat, I gain weight. And that gives me stress, which makes me more stressed out, which means I eat, or something along those lines. And so that would be maybe a vicious cycle, because the thing that is making me stressed out is going to lead to me doing more things that just make me more stressed out. And if stress is a bad thing, then that positive feedback cycle has a negative effect, a bad effect. A virtuous cycle might be like um, every time I, um, I get up a little earlier, I get more work done in the day, which gives me more time in the evening to do things that I enjoy doing, which makes me more interested in getting up early in the morning, which allows me to do more work or something along those lines. And that is a virtuous cycle because the, 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 the thing that I'm evaluating as good, which is the time in the evening I have for myself, is being amplified. And as I get more of it, I end up getting more of it later because it gives me more encouragement to reduce the amount of work time that bleeds over into that evening time. So they're both positive feedbacks, but one's good and one's bad, and that's why people use this term vicious or virtuous. But they're both uh, mathematically identical processes, but qualitatively different. Um, we use notations, a plus or an R for reinforcing. We use diagrams. Uh, so in the, the stock and flow diagrams and the causal loop diagrams, you might see a diagram of a snowball. You might see different diagrams of pluses. 
Um, th these loops uh, are often drawn counterclockwise or clockwise. So sometimes they put uh, you know, counterclockwise or clockwise uh, arrows around the, the, the um, pluses. The direction doesn't really matter. Um, the reason we put those there is when we have loops uh, among loops, sometimes it's difficult to see which loop you're talking about. And so if one's going counterclockwise, the other's going clockwise, this helps tell you that, okay, the loop you're pointing to here is the one that is going counterclockwise. And so uh, that's where this annotation is going with. But, uh, but the important notation here is the plus. On the flip side of that, uh, negative feedback, I'll also use the term balancing feedback or counteracting feedback. These are all equivalent terms. There's no difference between them. Just sometimes some texts use one or the other. Notations we use for that are either minus, B or C. Uh, B for balancing, C for counteracting. And again, just some authors use uh, minuses, some use Bs, some use Cs, and you just gotta get used to looking for them. Um, there's, uh, you know, I noticed like I didn't mention, these are some other alternatives. So here's the snowball. Um, this is showing uh, exponential growth. So that's another alternative for the images here. Here's um, like a, a, a seesaw or a balance. Uh, and uh, here is exponential decay. And uh, so here's the balance again, an alternative to the snowball and a bunch of different minuses. So, but all of the terms here mean the same thing. All the terms here mean the same thing. And positive does not necessarily mean good and negative does not necessarily mean bad. So um, you can have negative feedbacks that are good, and you can also have negative feedbacks that are bad. So um, as an example, there's a negative feedback that causes your toilet to refill to a particular level. Well, that's a good thing that that negative feedback ends up bringing that toilet water back to that level every time. Uh, but you know, there can also be negative feedbacks that, um, that might be bad and that they're constantly pulling something toward a state that you don't want them to be in. So we'll get more into that. But any questions about these terms or challenges? Is everybody clear on these terms? Okay. Arrows, so we talked about last time that arrows and causal loop diagrams represent causal links. So I have two variables, A and B, and I'm saying that A has a causal effect on B. And what that means is a change in A is going to result in a change in B. The, the sign uh, on the arrow tells you how that change has affected it. So a plus is going to tell me that there a, a, a positive increase in A is going to result in a positive increase in B. A minus means you get the opposite result. A positive increase in X gives me a negative or a decrease in Y, and vice versa. A minus here might mean that a negative or a decrease in X is going to give me a positive or an increase in Y. So because of that, instead of using pluses and minuses, that like up here, plus and minus, sometimes authors use S and O. This would be S for same, so whatever happens here, happens here. This would be O for opposite. Whatever happens here, the opposite thing happens there. So an increase in A causes an increase in B, an increase in X causes a decrease in Y. Questions about that? So uh, when you draw these things and figure out the polarities of the arrows, you have to, when you're coming up with a polarity, hold all the other effects constant. And that can be kind of difficult at first. So, you know, I've got these arbitrary labels, A, B, C, and X, but you might know that there actually is a relationship between one of these variables and another one, like C and A. It might be impossible for you to think of a case where C could increase and A would not also increase. And so you might say, well, okay, if, uh, if C increases in your head, you think, well, then A is gonna increase, and I know that A has got an increasing effect on X, and so that means that this must also have an increasing effect on X. In that case, you just simulated the system in your head, and that's what we're saying the computer's gonna do. Question. Oh, when you say interesting. So if there was some cause, so right now I'm just focusing on X, and that's why I only see the links coming into X. Mm -hmm. But if there were additional links connecting C and A, like let's say there's a link going all the way from C up here to A, 
If I'm trying to figure out what C's impact on X's, my brain is probably going to ask, is going to walk down the path of instead of just thinking about how C directly affects X, it's very tempting to think about how C might indirectly affect X. So if C affects A, and I know that A affects X, I in my brain oftentimes are going to jump to the fact to say, well then C must have the same effect on X as A does. But I don't want to go that far. I want to sort of think, imagine if somehow I lived in a universe where A didn't exist and it was only C. In that case, what is C's direct effect on X? And so it's almost like if I could somehow hold A constant and forget that A might change with C, then what would happen with C on X? Because what can happen in these complex systems is that the direct effect of something like C on X might be negative even though the indirect effect is positive. So you can sort of, uh, you can kind of think of it like, I can immediately be annoyed by my neighbor, but something my neighbor does ends up making my friend happy. And then I notice that I like when my friend is happier. So even though the immediate effect of my neighbor is annoying, the global effect of my friend being happier is positive. So when I model this, I have to only think about the immediate effect of my annoying neighbor, but when I, um, but then the computer will then connect everything together and then actually realize that actually there's a global effect that's balancing out the local effect. So locally they're annoying, but globally there is a positive impact and there's some happy medium, which maybe the, is the reason why you don't just get away from this neighbor, that you're like, eh, sometimes I'm next to this neighbor and sometimes I'm not. So, so that's kind of what I'm saying. You have to somehow focus on the immediate effect when you draw these arrows. Does that make sense or not? Any other questions about this? It's abstract. Uh, I think it'll get more concrete as we go into examples, but this is just the most generic. The other element that we'll have in these diagrams are delay. And they're either going to be um, you know, this little capacitor looking symbol to do parallel bars, or just the word delay will show up. And, uh, and so both of those things mean that there is a causal link, but that causal link is not immediate. Now, the question always is, how do I know when something's not immediate? Because nothing's ever immediate. So when do, is a delay important enough for me to put in the system? And that's usually when that delay is so long that it kind of is qualitatively different than all of the other delays in your system. So as an example, uh, the, you know, flow of hot water and water temperature. If you're in the shower and you're in a shower, it may be an old, uh, in an old building uh, or maybe in a hotel where the hot water heater is very far away, then if you turn the knob uh, to try to increase the flow of hot water, the temperature might not actually change in accordance to the knob until very much later. So you turn it up, you turn it down, you do get those temperature changes, but there's so much later. Now, all of the other things that are going on in that shower so uh, have a much more immediate, so nothing is immediate, truly immediate, but compared to the delay you get from turning the water and getting a temperature change, this delay is much, much bigger than all the others. And so that's why it's important for us to explicitly say there's a delay here. So it's, um, now sometimes it's still difficult to know exactly when the delays matter. And in those cases, that's kind of a more advanced topic, you can try a model with delay or without. Or you can put all the delays in, and then one of the parameters you experiment with is increasing and decreasing delays until you get a different result in your outcome. And so you might find that as long as the delay is under a certain very large number, it doesn't matter. So for the purposes of narrative, you just get rid of the complexity and just throw away the delay. And if anybody asks, you say, we experimented with a bunch of different types of delays. It didn't change the results. So for simplicity, we got rid of the delay in our model. Does that make sense? Okay. So then this all culminates in loops. The inner, so causal loop diagrams don't have to have loops, but they're boring if they don't. So all useful causal loop diagrams will probably have loops, but you don't know if you have a loop until you draw it. So you start drawing the causal link, and that technically is a causal loop diagram, even if you don't end up getting any loops. But you may end up finding the loops. 
And so after we draw all of these things, then we need to identify where we've had a loop. And so by a loop, I mean I follow the arrows from one variable and I can manage to find a path back to that variable. That's what I mean by a loop. And then I have to assign whether it is a positive feedback or a negative feedback. And the way I do that is by counting the number of links along uh, the loop. So if I have an odd number of uh, if I have an odd number of negative links, then I call it a negative feedback. If I have an even number of negative links, I call it a positive feedback. So as an example, what I'll do here, if I start from anywhere along the loop, let's say A, I count three links, but two of them are positive and one is negative. Because I counted one negative link, so that's an odd number of negative links, this is a negative feedback. And so I would label it as a negative feedback. Alternatively, if I had two negative links in this loop, because there's now an even number of negative links, then this is a positive feedback. And so I would label it as such with a positive there. So that's the, the key rule to remember here, is that when you're labeling these things, you count the number of negative links. And that might seem arbitrary. You know, why is that the case? Yeah, question? So your number of links isn't all of them in the whole model, or just the links in the loop? Just the links in the loop. Okay. It's, yeah, because you label every loop, so it's almost like you zoom in on the loop, forget everything else, and then zoom in on another loop, forget everything else, and that two dots are labeled all the loops. So why this weird convention of counting the odd loops? Well, if you think about unwrapping this loop, so that I start on A, it doesn't matter where I start, but I start anywhere, let's say on A, and um, I unwrap it so that it becomes this linear causal chain where A starts on A, but it ends on kind of, you can think of this as A in the past and A in the future. And so A has a positive, in, uh, uh, or a same impact on B. If I increase A, I increase B. B has a same inter a relationship with C. If I increase B, I increase C, but C has a different or an opposite relationship on A, a negative relationship on A. So if I increase C, I decrease A. So overall, if I increase A, I'm gonna get increases and then suddenly a decrease. So any increases in A now will result in a decreasing force on A later, which is why we call it a negative. Question. That's what I'm getting at here. Is that so, so the idea here is if you think about the sign of the changes, the changes only flip in their direction whenever you go through a negative link. And so if I go through an odd number of negative links, the total sign of the whole interaction will be negative. Because if I multiply a positive one, a positive one, and a negative one, then the negatives don't cancel and I'm left with the negative one. If I have an even number of negative links, then the two negative directions cancel each other out, or the four negative directions or six or whatever. An even number of negative relationships cancel themselves out, and then that's why the relationship overall becomes positive. Versus here, an odd number of negative relationships, you always have one left over, and that one left over makes the whole relationship negative. Does that make sense? Are there questions about those energy flows? So that's why we just count the negatives. Positives are important, but in order to figure out the polarity of the, of the loops, we care about changes in sign, and changes or opposite relationships are the negatives. Okay. And that's, I'm just sort of explaining that here. All right, so um, then the last thing you might see in a causal loop diagram are annotations. So I've already like annotated the loop direction, but once I've identified an interesting loop, that I want to point out to someone, then I might also put some text above it telling someone what that loop is doing. So <clears throat> in sort of a model of <clears throat> who knows, uh, psychology or uh, physiology, I might model, an aspect of it might model the hunger response. And so I've got uh, hunger, and whenever I'm hungry, then I go and I eat something, so I increase the amount eaten. But when I increase the amount eaten, then after a delay, I become less hungry. And so I have a balancing loop 
because there's only one negative link with a delay, a balancing with delay. And so if I would identify this, then I might say, okay, this is the control of food intake loop. So it's a way for my reader to, um, so if they're interested in the details, they can read the variables. But most of the time, we're only interested in the loops themselves. And so I can, if I you know, move back and squint, all I can see is control of food intake has a balance, is a balancing loop. And so that tells me that there is this balancing force um, for controlling food intake. But there might be other loops that are, uh, that are not balancing loops, they're reinforcing loops, and I might label them as such. So this helps our reader kind of get an idea of what we're modeling. So I've got um, the, here, this is um, an example kind of in the hot water, the shower case, comfort seeking, this is someone uh, working with the, uh, the shower knob. Here, if I'm modeling at a higher level in society, I've got, uh, as you increase um, drug-related crime, you get an increase in police uh, action. As you get an increase in police action, you get an increase in drug seizures. With an increase in drug seizures, you get a decrease in supply. With a, now, with an, if you get a decrease in supply, you get an increase in price. And with an increase in price, you actually maybe get an increase in drug-related crime. So that's an interesting spiral there because this, each one of these links makes sense, but when you put them all together, you end up actually increasing crime and not decreasing crime under this model. So that is a reinforcing loop, and that's why it's listed here as a crime spiral, because reducing the amount of drugs ultimately increases the price, which causes people to move in to take advantage of that economic pressure. So, um, so different types of things we can model, all the way from inside the body, from just outside the body, to the level of societies. And at different for each one of these, we're going to look for loops, and then we're going to label those loops, because once we point out the loops, that's really where the interesting parts of the model are happening. So questions about any of those so far? OK. Yes? So would there be a way to like analyze the potential solutions to said problems, yeah. such as like making all drugs legal? Yeah, in fact, there is a, uh, a chapter um, I guess it's going to be in chapter two, where Moorcroft will actually talk exactly about this example and alternatives that you might try. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. So you could imagine, and I think this is chapter two, but I think there's later it's in more detail. But, um, but that's the kind of the whole idea. It's like you can model the way things are now, and then you can say, well, what are a bunch of other things we could try? You listed one, so it's a hypothetical scenario. So we can model that hypothetical scenario and then see what the loops are there. And maybe then we end up finding that uh, there's, there's maybe still a reinforcing loop, but now there's a balancing loop uh, that is going to kind of keep things in check. So maybe this doesn't explode. Or maybe it's purely, maybe we're gonna, that, that manages to totally get rid of the problem, although that's, that's maybe unlikely. So, but yes, you can, you can test your hypothetical solutions by modeling them and then look for these dynamic hypotheses to get a guess at what's going on. But then when we build the stock and flow diagrams, we're able to hit run on the computer and actually see what the computer thinks is gonna happen. And that's absolutely an application that, like, that would be great for this. So. All right, any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> The negative feedback that you that you wouldn't want. Um, yeah, so negative feedbacks are often by design. So that's kind of a tough one, but but oftentimes you get negative feedbacks that um, are so let's say, and I'll get to this example here in a second, but nature often wants to keep certain things in balance that we as humans in making use of nature maybe don't want in balance where nature wants them. So as an example, um, you uh, you know you might set the heat on your home in the winter and then you might set it to cool in the summer. Well, there is a balancing loop where the where nature is always trying to keep your home at the same temperature as the outside. So that's maybe a negative feedback from nature that we view as, as bad, and we'd like to reduce that because we'd like to keep the home constant. And unfortunately, one of the ways that we do that is just by pumping a lot of energy into our heating, ventilation, and cooling. Now maybe if we did a lot more insulation, we wouldn't need far additional loops because the insulation would slow down the natural process. And so I'll kind of get to that. But but um, most negative feedback you talk about are kind of usually human implemented and often by design. 
But so the negative feedbacks we don't like are often ones that are introduced by the habitat where we have shifted a system out of balance and the natural proxy is kind of bring it back in the, the natural balance. But we, because we're humans and you know we need to make use of things, we need to keep the lights on in order to get the crafts or whatever, are the driving you out of balance. Yes? Is that where uh, in the book they invisible hand? Excellent question. So the invisible hand is kind of this general idea that if you have a web of these interconnections, things naturally sort of uh, balance as one of them, but there can be apparent forces that look like external, this is where I go about the endogenous perspective. An invisible hand is something where you might assume that in order to have like a, a, an efficient market price of corn, that you need like a government to come in and just set the price. But an economist would say that well, actually, if you set these individual trades up just right, people will naturally set the price, and it'll come to equilibrium at a good level, and that level that naturally emerges from the system will be the right price for corn. And so that's like an invisible hand in that it seems like a government-like entity came in and said, this is the price of corn, but in reality, it emerged naturally from within. All right, so here's the example that I was just talking about, where we've got two negative feedback loops that are joined together. And so we've got air temperature, and that's air temperature in a home. And, um, and then so if the air temperature, temperature goes up in a home, then the furnace heat production is going to go down because it's hotter in the home. So we're going to turn down the furnace. Now, um, when we come up with these links, it's always tempting to, 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 to keep going around the, the loop like you're telling a story. Like I said, when the temperature goes up, that caused the furnace production to go down, and then um, I'm tempted to then continue the story, then say, and as the furnace production goes down, then what happens here? Now, you can, if you're, once you get practice at this, you can tell those stories, but it leads you to mistakes when you're just starting out here. So I need to see that there's a same relationship here. And so as, um, as the air temperature goes up, the furnace production goes down. And so then the question here is what link am I going to put here? Well, if I say the furnace production goes down, and then I say, so that must mean that the energy content um, in the home, being dumped into the home, is also going to go down. Because I've just said down, I'm going to be very tempted to write a negative there. When in reality, whatever happened here, happened here. So that's why when I draw these links, initially, just to be, to make sure I'm not gonna make any mistakes, is I analyze link by link individually. So I say, as air temperature goes up, furnace production goes down. Okay, and then I forget that. And then I say, as furnace production goes up, what happens to the energy content in the home? Well, it also goes up. So as long as, if I use the hypothetical scenario, wherever the source, whatever the causal source is, goes up, then it's easy for me to figure out whether to put a plus or a minus here, because whatever the other thing does, goes up or down, tells me whether it should be positive or negative. So um, then I can say, well, if the energy content goes up, then the air temperature will go up. If I go around the other side, I can say as the air temperature goes up, the heat loss to the outdoors is also going to go up. And then if I forget that, and I say if the heat loss went up, then I can say energy is gonna be leaked out of the home, so that's gonna go down. So I end up getting two loops here, and if I count around the loops, I've got one negative link here, and I've got one negative link here. So negative, positive, 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 negative, positive. So these are both labeled negative. These outside things, the thermostat's target temperature, I put into the model, and they're important. As I, if I set my temperature set point higher, I'm gonna get more furnace production. If the outdoor temperature goes up, you know, gets out of winter, then the heat loss is gonna go down. So these are important for me to think about the whole system, but if I'm thinking about that invisible hand, then I'm only really focusing on the loops, and these don't participate in the loops. Question? So, so you said when the outdoor temperature goes up, 
the down. So, um, and this is you know, a winter scenario. And so, if it's really cold outside, so but it's why warm. Is there a minus next to the, outdoor temperature? the minus is next to the arrow connected to the outdoor temperature. So, the minus is labeling the arrow, saying that whatever happens with outdoor temperature, the opposite thing is going to happen with heat loss. So, if the temperature goes up, then the heat loss is going to go down because it's not as cold outside, so you're not going to get as much flux of heat going out. Okay. I don't understand how you are um, assuming that the air temperature is going up, though. Is it, shouldn't the air temperature go down when the outdoor temperature gets increased? Well, so that's a good point. So in my hypothetical, I said if the air temperature goes up, then um, this will go down. Okay. If the air temperature goes down, this will go up. Because if it could, that's right. In order for me to figure out how to draw the, like, so I usually draw the links first, and then I say, what are the polarity of the links? And so my tool, my heuristic for, for the assigning polarity is to say, if the thing on this side of the arrow goes up, does the thing on this side of the arrow go up or down? Other questions about how to label that? Okay. So similar example. Um, this is the same type of diagram, but now we've got an inventory of cars at dealerships. So as the inventory of cars goes up, you have more inventory, they want to sell more cars. And so that means that the price of those cars is going to go down. So it's an economic thing. And then as the, as the market price then, if it were to go up, so again, I'm just forgetting about my last statement. If the market price were, go, were to go up, then the car, uh, the people who make the cars like to see the higher prices, and so they will produce more cars. If they produce more cars, that is going to increase the inventory. And then, you know, then the loop gets closed. That's it. On the other side of things, though, if the market price goes up, the consumers are going to be less interested in buying the car. And so that's why there's a minus here. If the market price goes up, the sales go down. Now, if the sales were to go up, then the inventory would go down. So in this case, I've got on this side, I've got a loop that has a plus, a plus, and a minus. So it's got only one negative. So I mu this is a negative feedback, similar to the previous example. Now, on the other side, I have three negatives. I have a negative, a negative, and a negative. And so that's another, still an odd number of negatives, so that's a negative feedback. So it just goes to show that at the micro scale, this looks very different than the diagram, the previous diagram, because in the previous diagram, I only had one negative link on both sides. But here, I've got three negative links on this side and only one negative link on this side. But from a loop perspective, I've got two interacting negative loops. And so we'll find that these two systems are very similar to each other. There's two, two balancing loops fighting each other. Um, market price will kind of always be one thing, but while that market price or the temperature of the home is one thing, you've constantly got an engine <coughs> producing cars and an engine purchasing cars. Just like in the home example, you've constantly got a furnace producing heat and a leaky a house leaking heat to the outside while the temperature is staying constant. So both processes are similar. So I can put them next to each other, and I'd see that both of them have this property <coughs> of having balancing loops with a stable quantity in between the balancing loops. Then these two balancing loops may be keeping this stable quantity in check, one temperature of the home, one price of the cars. but they've got a perpetually unmet goal on these two different sides. I um, constantly, I would really like to not run my furnace, but I always end up running my furnace, at least to some extent. Um, over here, um, car production, I can't get enough, so I always want to produce more cars. Um, likewise, over here, I'd really like to not uh, lose heat, but I can't help it. It's always going to lose. Whenever my, my, temp whenever my inside is, uh, hotter than the outside, I'm going to lose heat. 
Likewise over here, so long as the market price is sufficiently low, you're always gonna get car sales. People are gonna keep buying cars. So you've got one goal, the other goal, they're kind of fighting each other, and this is what we call escalation behavior. So this is one of these things that, um, so we'll go over all of these different motifs when we get down to it. This is again just kind of picturing ahead that if you start looking at these diagrams and you start seeing these motifs, I already showed you that S-shaped growth motif, balancing necks to reinforce them. But here, if I have two balancing necks to each other, then that may indicate escalation behavior, which means some part of my system are gonna sit still while the rest of them just keep uh, spinning, fighting each other in order to keep that middle thing still. And so on the left side, we view this as a bad effect. It's an engine of weight. You know, it's, it's, it's like a car engine. I mean, your car engine is constantly turning over, and as it turns over, it ends up moving the car, which causes it to turn over more. And so here, this is an engine that is generating a lot of waste just to keep the temperature constant. But over here, we might view, depending on, I guess, your perspective, this is a good effect. Because here, we've got supply and demand that are interacting, and, uh, where, and, and that's causing us to be producing cars that are end up being actually sold. So um, new cars are produced, and then they're actually used. And so we might view this economic engine as a good effect. So even though we have escalation behavior, where that motif, that sounds like that's maybe kind of negative or something, it's really just meant to identify that we have two negative feedback loops interacting and we're gonna call it escalation. So mathematically, these two things are identical, even though qualitatively, we might view this as positive and that as negative. So are there questions about that? This basic idea that we're looking for weight. Yeah, yeah. So when you're constructing a property diagram, um, what's the best method to know like, like whether it's positive or negative? Like I know like at the end, it says this is fine, but like, I would say that if you're having trouble, if you draw up two variables and you say, you know what, this variable, sometimes when it increases, there's a decrease in this variable, but other times when it increases, there's a, there's a decrease or something, like, and you're having trouble like coming up with a consistent rule, then there's two things you can do. Um, the one thing is to say, am I, have I really broken this system down as far as it could be? there might be a hidden variable that you're missing. And if you just put that third variable or fourth variable or fifth variable in, then now the links you've got are much simpler and they will be more consistent. So like for example, like maybe Eric's thinking like maybe geographic abundance, maybe, I don't know, weather or like part of the year, like greater increase in the temperature, so that's consistent? Well, I mean, it could be, um, I mean, so this, Whenever you're indoor, and so this one is meant to kind of be like a simple as one where whenever the inside is hotter than the outside, we just kind of know physically that you're gonna get this flux of heat. Now, you could say, well, what if you live in some weird home that has fans inbuilt into the walls and is able to sort of somehow reduce heat flux as like an alternative way to cool or something like that. Then you sort of say, well, when the fans are on, you might have one relationship, and when the fans are off, you have a different relationship. So if I didn't model the fans, then this link would be kind of incomplete. But once I model the fans, then I can sort of say that, well, in general, air temperature has this effect on heat loss. But when the fans are on, then maybe the fans have uh, a, the opposite effect on heat loss or something like that. But if you, um, so the idea is hopefully you break things out. The, the alternative is, is you simplify what you're modeling and you say, you know, certain times of the year, this relationship holds. Other times of the year, this other relationship holds. I'm only going to model one time of the year, and I'll build a second model for the other time of the year, and then I'll ask my stakeholder, what are you interested in? And if the stakeholder's only interested in winter, then I'll give them my winter model. And if the stakeholder's only interested in summer, then I'll give them my summer model. So my model doesn't have to capture a whole year. I might have to narrow the scope for tractability to make the model go. Does that make sense? Think about narrowing the scope or you know, if you, if, and that's what I mean you, uh, for the first couple lectures. A, a more complex model is not necessarily a, a better model. Yeah. 
Any other questions about this? All right, so, um, so let's do this sort of example, a classroom example here. So uh, chickens and eggs. So, so how do we label these things? So um, to take 30 seconds and talk to your neighbor, there's three question marks on here. So I want you, I want to figure out what, what labels go in these three spots. These are two link labels and that is a loop label. So talk to your neighbors and come up with some consensus and then we'll do some voting. So how many people would vote that this question mark should be a minus? How many people would vote that this question mark should be a plus? Okay, that's good, all right. How about this one? How many people go minus for this one? How many people go plus for this one? All right. How many people go minus for this one? How many people say plus for this one? Good, all right. So I see a large majority of people that are saying the right things here. I would do pluses for all three. So as you get more chickens, then you're going to get more eggs. Or likewise, if you killed all the chickens, you would get less eggs. If you get less eggs, you get less chickens. So, um, so although we view this as a growth loop, you can also think of that hypothetical example of what would happen if I externally shocked the system by removing all the eggs? What would ultimately happen to the chickens? But then it would start growing again in this particular example. So, more chickens gives me more eggs, more eggs gives me more chickens, and this whole thing together is a reinforcing loop or a positive feedback loop. Yeah. All right? I have a question. Yeah. So if it's a reinforcing or positive, then what was the negative idea? Um, balancing, balancing or counteracting. Counteracting, got it. Thank you. All right, here's another. So uh, let's take 30 seconds. There are three loops. So uh, there's a loop here. There's one other loop that I'm not going to point out, and there's a loop over here. But I claim there's three loops there. Label the three loops. So um, go ahead and take 30 seconds and talk to your neighbor, and then we'll see if we can find the three loops and label them. loop. Why do you say balancing? <laughs> One negative link. So if I go through here, I got three links. Negative, positive, positive, only one. So yeah, I would label that as a balancing. Let me see if I can uh, scribble on here. Maybe. All right, so I'm going to say call this a balancing. So I'll put a little negative there. Pardon the bad mouse writing. All right. 
So um, next loop. Somebody else. Um, uh, what is the uh, a second loop? Yeah. All the way around the end. So turn it around here. All the way around. All right. So we got um, all the way around here is Positive. a loop. So um, and then you said how are you labeling it? Positive. Positive. And um, why do you say positive? Two negative. So let's go through and count. So we've got one negative, positive, 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 two negatives, positive. So yeah, there's two negatives. An even number of negatives. So that all the way around there, I would say, is a reinforcing loop. And it's tricky here, and this is what it takes for him to read these things, is that you have to know that this annotation is not labeling this middle thing because that middle thing is not a loop. This annotation is labeling the big one. And that's what kind of helps to show that. It directs the reader's eyes. All right, what's the third loop? Is, um, what, what's the third loop? Anybody? Yeah. Um, it's the one on the opposite side of the first loop we just said. So B3, B1, B2? Yes, sir. And what would that be, negative or positive? Balancing, which is another name for negative. <laughs> right, so I could also put um, you know, B here instead of a minus. And I could put an R here. Um, I could also put a C for counteracting. And then likewise, this one. And then I could put this as a B or a C. All right, any questions about that? All right. Okay, so last classroom exercise here. So take 30 seconds, talk to your neighbor, and tell me there is an error in both of these diagrams. Find the errors. One error in both. Justify your answer. Why do you say it's a negative loop? Because there's only one link. There's only one link. So here, the identification here is there is a loop. goes from D to C to B to D. There's a positive link, a single negative, another positive. So totally, there's only one negative link. So this has been mislabeled is not a positive. It is a negative or balancing. All right. So... Somebody from, say, this front corner here. Yes. What's wrong with the other one? The, I guess it connects to the loop because they have the Exactly. So the problem here is there is no loop. This is not a loop. It looks like a loop, was drawn like a loop, but everything's pointing to D. D is like an outcome of the system. It doesn't have any causal influence on anything else. We've got a bunch of things. C affects B, B affects D, C affects D, but nothing affects, they, all the effects kind of flow downhill to D. And so it's a causal loop diagram. We still call it a CLD, but there are no loops in it. Yeah. So then do you use the bottom arrow in there if you're drawing something like that? Like, or is it just like a scheme that since C reflects B and B reflects D, that C would reflect D also? Excellent question. So this goes back to what I was saying about local effects versus global effects. What this bottom arrow means is that I can identify in the physical system some mechanism where C directly affects B. 
if I were to get rid of this, I'm saying that C does not directly affect B, but there might be an indirect connection. So, um, you know, as an example, um, there might be some politician in Washington that does have an effect on your life, but not a direct effect. Now, there might be some politician here in Tempe that maybe is your boss. And so the politician here in Tempe maybe has a direct effect on your life and indirect because they affect uh, things that go on in Tempe. But the politician in Washington has no direct effect on you, but you still care about that politician because they have indirect effects. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so we're not going to do this one, but if you want more practice at this, um, here's a more complicated one with lots of loops in it. And you can feel free to practice that one as an example. So any other questions from today? All right, so um, last couple of things I want to mention here is, uh, and this kind of goes back to this direct link versus indirect link, is a couple of our minor notes when you're drawing these links. Um, you want to make sure to not cor uh, confuse correlation and causation. So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I've got the sun causes ice cream to melt, the sun causes sunburn, but you can't say that ice cream causes sunburn. So even though they're correlated, you can't draw a causal link between them. So this would be incorrect to say, say ice cream sales increase sunburn rate, even though it is true that as ice cream sales go up, so do sunburn rates. But a better causal diagram, and this might also get to your question about, or at least my, try my answer to your question about breaking things out, we're missing something here. And we needed the average temperature, and it has a causal effect on both. And so by expanding our model, we see that I actually can justify that as temperature grows up, goes up, sales will go up, and as temperature goes up, sunburn will go up. I can make a, a causal, a physical relationship there. Um, and so this is the correct CLD, but not that one. Likewise, when we're choosing our variable names, we are, there's different variables we could choose that make our job easier for us. So one thing that we always do is all the variables on the, at the sides of these links should be nouns or noun phrases. I should say costs cause an increase in price. The cost of running a business might cause an increase in the price of the thing I'm selling. But I don't want to put a verb in there and say costs rise causes an increase in price rises. We want the verb to be captured in the link, not out at the edges. So nouns out here, and then the kind of verbs or predicates or whatever in the links. Similarly, we want to try to make our variables have a clear sense of direction. So it's better to say, if I get praise from the boss, my morale will go up, or the morale of the company will go up. But if I say feedback from the boss, I don't know if that's negative feedback or positive feedback. And then if I say mental attitude, when somebody says they have a, a you know, a, an increase in their attitude, I don't know if they mean they've got, a, was that a bad attitude or a good attitude? So I want to try to give them uh, very clear directions. The last thing is I want to make the normal sense of direction positive. This isn't, um, you know, totally important. This isn't the most important thing, but it does make things a lot easier. Rather than saying that as I get an increase in costs, I get an increase in losses. It's better to say, as I get an increase in costs, I get a decrease in profits. So I want to sort of capture these, these opposing effects in the link, not in the name. That's been kind of the last point that I wanted to make today. Are there questions about that before we close up with the attendance stuff? Does that make sense? These three rules, noun phrases, sense of direction, positive. And we'll see that again when we talk about the chapter next week. All right, so uh, coming up, um, lecture B2. If you'd like to bring your laptop in, we're going to uh, basically have a half lecture where we give the lecture, and the other half will work on the drawing these CLDs in VinSim. So we're going to be uh, uh, have no, is VinSim on these computers. So you can also just use a local computer, but you might want to have a place to save your work or upload your work. There's a uh, Money's Point due on Sunday, um, and then. 
a week from today is when the next chapter is due, chapter two in Moorcroft. So look out for the exercise on Canvas, which is already available if you want to start, start ahead. And then we'll Thursday morning, or Thursday at the beginning of the, the lecture, we'll start a little reading assessment. Questions? Um, you can download this on your own computer, and it's already installed on your computer. And that's all I've got. So attendance exercise for today. Um, then give me one of the different ways to say um, positive feedback. Any alternative way to say positive feedback? 